So I picked up this book the other day from my local basket full of notebooks in a corner of my room that doesn't see the light of day. And after reading it, I feel like it deserves a review, because I'm all about supporting our local young authors. So let's take a look. This book is called The White Filly, and it's written by London Kaler. Now, my first impression is that this was written by a fourth grader who thinks her writing is a gift to the world, and who thinks someday someone else is going to be reading this story besides herself on the floor of her bedroom with the door closed. Second thing I notice, the longest chapters are only a page long tops. Some chapters are literally only a paragraph. There's also this nonsense with the clip art, which frankly I don't know what the author was going for with that. I was willing to give it the benefit of the doubt, however, so I continued reading, and honestly, after I finished it, I realized something. I didn't just read a book. I just went on a journey. Let's tackle this beast, shall we? So our story starts somewhere in Nevada at a stock show. There are two siblings named Karen and Jake who are happily watching some horses run around. The text claims that these horses are being trained, but I fail to see what running around in a circle is supposed to accomplish there. Karen's dad asks her if she'd like a horse of her own, and then the author goes into about as much detail as she's capable of, describing the different horses Karen can choose from. She knows how to use terms like Andalusian and Palomino, but she doesn't seem to know that there's literally no place in the United States where it is possible to get a $100 horse, and I think that says a lot about what kind of book this is. The chapter ends with Karen wondering what horse she'll choose. Literally, that's the last line of the chapter. At least the author grasps the concept of cliffhangers, though I'm not sure if she knows what constitutes a good one. There's also an orange-looking person drawn at the bottom who seems only mildly concerned that one hand is afflicted with some kind of muscular dystrophy and the other is clipping through her face. The next chapter is titled Sonia, which means we're probably about to be introduced to a new character. And given the last chapter's cliffhanger about buying horses, I wonder who it's going to be! Oh look, it's Karen's eccentric vegan aunt who lives in the mountains and eats sagebrush. No, it's the horse Karen picks out, obviously. You should be able to figure out the color and sex of this horse pretty easily. It's only the goddamn title of the book. Also, there's a little detail that worries me. It says here that after buying Sonia, they get the trailer for free. God help this author if she ever tries to buy a horse, because there's a 99% chance she'll end up riding the thing bareback to her house after realizing that giant mobile horse stables aren't like fucking hamster cages on Black Friday. The chapter ends on another cliffhanger where Karen hears a noise and sees that Sonya's being stolen. Good job, kid. You've had the horse for less than 24 hours and someone's already using her to fulfill their escapist fantasy of running free with the wild horses in the American wilderness. There's also another drawing down at the bottom. The orange person has reappeared, and she seems to have gotten oranger since the last time we saw her. She's also holding a large branch, almost as big as she is, presumably to use as a weapon, but I think her deformed arms are going to make that difficult, seeing as they don't appear to have joints. But she has it good compared to the dude over here who must be on fire or something. I can't say this is a bad thing, though. If I had three-fingered paddles for arms, I'd want to light myself on fire, too. So Karen swoops in to attack the horse thief, but it's just her brother, Jake, taking the horse out for a midnight ride on a dare. A bit anticlimactic, but Karen promises that Mom will hear about this. The next chapter, yes, those last two sentences were an entire chapter, Karen and Jake go home after putting Sonia away and find their psychic mother is up making them hot chocolate. She knows instinctively that some shit just went down and says to her kids, let's discuss what happened. I can only assume she's been sitting cross-legged at the table with her hands folded the whole time like a wise old sage on top of a mountain, ready to dispense platitudes instead of, you know, stopping her kids from going outside alone in the middle of the night like a responsible parent. Maybe now we'll get some real conflict to juice up this story- oh uh, wait, their mom just says she's disappointed, doesn't ground Jake, and then sends them both to bed. Alright then. I have a feeling this line of dialogue here was taken straight from the author's own parents because this sounds like something only a parent who's read a few Love and Logic parenting books would say. The chapter ends with Karen saying she'll let Jake off this time, but no free bees next time. I'm not even going to comment on the illustration for this one because frankly it's the least horrifying one we've seen, so I'm going to give the illustrator a pass. Now here is where things start to go off the rails. The chapter opens up with Jake bringing over two of his friends, Mark and Terrence, and also Ben, who dared him to ride Karen's horse, but Ben literally never shows up again and he has no dialogue, so he doesn't matter. 
Terence is described as being friendly and having blonde hair evenly laid across his head, whatever that's supposed to mean. Mark, on the other hand, has a cool dude look on his face, overly spiked hair, and a flame t-shirt. Now we're talking. I've always wanted a Guy Fieri Wild West AU fanfiction. Now if you're thinking, ooh, I bet Mark is going to be entertaining, then you would be absolutely right. This kid is such a douche that the first thing he does is ask Jake if Karen is his girlfriend. Let's not think about the unfortunate implications of that. After asking his somewhat disturbing question, Mark immediately starts hitting on Karen, who immediately wants to fight him. Sadly, Karen's righteous rage never really pans out as Jake and Terrence change the subject and reveal why they're really here. Karen's uncle is just giving away horses as if they're really large, rideable puppies, and Terrence wants one. Horses must be worth absolutely nothing in this universe. Are they all just cloned in a factory somewhere and sent out en masse to ranchers across the country? Are they like pigeons? Do horses just run around the downtown areas of major cities eating cold fries out of the garbage and pooping on park benches? Ugh. Anyway, Terrence explains the situation to Karen and says that he heard she's really good with horses. Karen immediately decides after knowing him for two seconds that Terrence is a nice guy and she's more than happy to assist him in his horse finding endeavors. Karen, you dumb bitch. All he has to do is compliment you and you're eating out of the palm of his hand. Where is that righteous rage? There's some boring bullshit here in the middle before Mark decides to start talking, resulting in my favorite part of this book so far. Let me read this for you so you can fully appreciate this stroke of literary genius. When they got to Terrence's house, he put his horse in the one stall barn and tack room his dad had built. What you gonna name him, asked Jake. Well, I was thinking about, started Terrence. How about Spirit, asked Karen. How about Girl Stealer, like his owner, shouted Mark. I'd better go, said Karen. I'll come over later. Now you blew it, said Terence. So what, girl stealer, said Mark. I don't want anything to do with you and your horse, lame -o. His name is Buck, shouted Terence. Once again, Mark is proving to be the most entertaining character in this whole story. All Terence and Karen have to do is talk to each other once, and already Mark is flipping his shit like Terence and Karen ran off to make out in a broom closet during his grandmother's funeral. The next chapter is titled Valentine's Day, in much larger print than has been used before, so you know it's extra important. Terence tries to sneak jelly beans into Karen's locker, but she catches him and asks him what he's doing. Um, um, well, Terence stammered. Oh, you caught me. Here, take the jelly beans and please, please don't tell anyone. Okay, said Karen. Unfortunately for Terence, Mark was listening, and he told everyone. Ah, uh, yes, there's my little shit unable to keep his grubby little hands out of anyone's business. He goes around telling everyone that Terence is in love. Also, I think the author had a stroke here because there's a statement from Terence right in the middle of all this dialogue that looks like it's from the previous chapter and makes no sense in context. I guess this thing never got proofread before it went to print. Oh well, you can only expect so much. As Mark goes around spreading the oh-so-embarrassing news of Terence's crush, Word gets out to a third grader named Marianne, who has a huge crush on Terence. She's described as having an annoying, squeaky voice, but apparently she's still the fifth most popular girl in school because she's so pretty. The statement baffles me because if the author was in fourth grade when she wrote this, she would know that there is no way in hell a third grader gets popular in a school full of older kids based on looks alone. Therefore, it is logical to assume that this story was written by a lizard person. Mark refuses to tell Marianne who Terence is in love with exactly, so, like a colossal ass lamp, she assumes it has to be her. She confronts Terence about it, and he turns her down. And then, like some dude drinking fuckboy, she throws a fit and exclaims that she's been nicer to him than anyone else, and yet he still doesn't love her. Terence is decidedly not impressed, and he leaves her to cry by herself, like the stone cold bastard he is. The chapter concludes with further proof that the author is not, in fact, an innocent human girl. Apparently in this school, teachers can find out about rumors only started that morning down to who started them, and they can send kids to detention in the middle of class for being gossipy little chickens. 
I think at this point, it's only fair to assume that in the years since writing this, the author has infiltrated our government and is currently finalizing plans to turn the entire United States into a hive-minded labor camp to produce weapons for the intergalactic space lizard war that's probably still going on, as intergalactic space lizard wars do. It's probably too late to hunt her down and burn her at the stake, so let's just keep going, shall we? Marianne, undeterred by her sound rejection that afternoon, decides that if Terence doesn't love her right now, she'll just have to make him love her. But first, she has to drive a wedge between him and Karen. Her brilliant plan? Write a letter to Terence from Karen saying that she doesn't like him anymore. Marianne apparently spent hours on this, trying to craft the perfect letter, and eventually she comes up with this. Dear Terence, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but we have to move on. The good news is that I know of a girl you might be interested in. Her name is Mary Ann, and she is very pretty, sweet, and never tells lies. You did something to hurt my feelings, and I never want to see you again. Sincerely, Karen. Very subtle, Mary Ann. He's definitely not going to guess something's off. I'm sure he'll fling himself into your arms, crying about how wrong he was to judge you and how badly that evil witch Karen hurt him. You're a goddamn genius. The next day, Terence goes to confront Karen about the letter she sent him, which is actually pretty astounding. And I'm starting to think Marianne's plan wasn't that ridiculous after all. I mean, clearly she's a yandere, which means she probably knows every last thing there is to know about Terence. Which means she knows Terence is actually an idiot, and she probably figured out that even if her letter was terribly written, as long as it said it was from Karen, Terence would absolutely believe it was from Karen, which means she knew exactly what she was doing this entire time. Oh my god! Terence says it's fine if Karen wants to break up with him, which causes Karen to go completely off the rails and start yelling at him in a panicked frenzy. Terence is confused and tries to clarify, but because Karen has apparently never communicated with a real human in her entire life, she keeps yelling at him and tells him that she never wants to see him again. Oh my god, Marianne won! All is lost! Oh wait, never mind, Karen is suddenly fine again and she and Terence agree to stop fighting and keep being friends. Although at this point I think Terence is only agreeing to this out of fear for his own safety. Buddy, if a girl starts screaming at you just at the mention of breaking up, don't wait for her to throw a glass at your head, leave that bitch while you can! The next chapter starts with Karen's birthday and boy was it a good one. Karen's dad tells Karen that they're going to breed Sonia with another horse named Blue Moon. The author's exact thought process while writing this was probably... Hang on, was I writing a horse book before? Oh shoot, I should probably get back to that. Let's give the horse a boyfriend instead. Brilliant! Blue Moon's owner, Mr. Snyder, brings him over to Karen's family's ranch, and he and Sonia quickly become inseparable. Mr. Snyder makes a comment to Karen about tonight being a blue moon, and to not let his horse, who is inexplicably living with Karen's family right now, run off. Which ends the chapter on a weirdly ominous note. Gee, I wonder what's gonna happen in chapter 10. Yep, there he goes, the horse is fucking gone. It's so dramatic, the author had to change the type and size of the font just to communicate the severity of what happened. Karen freaks out and runs into her dad downstairs. She explains the situation, and they ride off into the night like a pair of horse-wrangling crusaders to find the escaped animals. Which they don't. Oh my god, what if the horses don't come back? All is lost! Oh wait, never mind, Mr. Snyder found them and they're totally fine. Don't forget to lock the stall door, he says, ever the clairvoyant asshole. Although frankly, this whole incident makes me wonder about Mr. Snyder's intentions. He makes jokes about Blue Moon escaping, and that night, that exact thing happens. And then he's the one to find them and he just happens to know how they escaped? Sounds like this guy has some kind of hero complex. I wouldn't trust him within 500 feet of anything I care about. He might set my house on fire just to be the one to put it out. After this, the author skips an entire year ahead, which you have to figure out through context clues since in chapter 9 it's Karen's birthday on May 20th, and in this chapter Sonia's foal is born on May 12th. The author gives no clues as to what our heroes got up to in this time, though it can't be very interesting since the author didn't even bother to tell us she'd skipped ahead an entire year. So the foal is born, his name is Rocky, blah blah blah, Terrence gets to meet him, the author is extremely specific about what Terrence's phone number is, it's boring, whatever, next chapter. Oh god, this story just doesn't end, does it? Looks like the author has forgotten about the horses again, and now it's time to introduce yet Another love triangle, complete with two more characters with K names. As if Karen and Kate weren't confusing enough. 
Oh yeah, there's a character named Kate in this. She's apparently Karen's best friend, but I honestly forgot she existed until this chapter, although... Hang on. No. No, okay, no, I didn't forget about her. She literally hasn't been mentioned before this. At all. So now we have, all within the same chapter, three new characters whose names start with a K sound. Oh my fucking god, kill me now. Do, do you care about this chapter? Do you honestly care at this point who's crushing on who and who's breaking up with who? Literally, none of this has to do with Karen or Terrence or even Mark, who I miss, frankly. All of this is between Karen's brother, her best friend, and two sisters who are apparently new to the school. Nothing that happens in these two chapters has any effect on what little semblance of a plot there is. This is like the worst pair the spares storyline I have ever heard in my entire life. Who gives a shit, right? Let's just keep going. So it's summertime now. Karen and friends are having a little camp out and she hears a noise outside. I'll give you two guesses as to what it is. Is it A, someone trying to steal her horse, or B, the horses escaping by themselves? Let's just read it and see. <clears throat> Karen walked out of the tent and saw a strange sight. The horse looked like Sonia, except the horn. Sonia, said Karen, is that you? Of course, said the horse. Karen's eyes grew wide. You can talk? You're a unicorn! <sighs> I need a drink. Yes, it's true, said Sonia. Karen, Karen, what was that noise we heard? yelled Kate from inside the tent. It's Sonia, she answered. Look, Karen, I need to tell you something. In October, Blue Moon Rocky and I are going to have to leave to the faraway land of Cornucopia. <laughs> what the fuck? I have no choice. The Unicorn King is very demanding, said Sonia. <sighs> Well, okay, I have to hand it to the author. I did not see that coming. I honestly don't think I can make any more jokes about this because the joke is that I had to actually read this with my own two eyes. Just look at the art for this chapter. I've never related to Karen so much this entire story. Oh my god, who slipped LSD into my hot cocoa? Bravo, alien lizard girl. You have defeated me. May you one day give M. Night Shyamalan a run for his money. After that bombshell full of crazy, this chapter is barely worth mentioning. Not even Mark crawling back out of whatever hole the author threw him in can bring back my will to live at this point. Sorry, sweet prince. You trying and failing once again to get Karen to love you is not enough to cheer me up. It's time we just accept our fates together and limp to the finish line. And now we reach the emotional climax of this steaming mountain of shit. Karen sadly bids her horses adieu, and they disappear into the rainbow unicorn mist or wherever they came from. Jake asks Karen the next morning where the horses went, to which Karen replies, They left. Understandably, Jake wants to organize a search party to find them, but all Karen has to say is, She left for a good reason. And he drops the idea as if he has any reason to believe that horses are capable of rational thought and his sister isn't completely delusional. She doesn't even tell her parents, and they never comment on the horses being gone, so I'm guessing they just don't care. Hell, they're probably glad to be rid of them since they've escaped almost every chapter they've been in. Months pass, and Karen gets on with her life. She gets a hamster, and her family goes on a vacation over the summer. The sadness of losing her horse, who's barely in the book, must have really gotten to her over the school year because she seems downright depressed to me. She actually starts talking to her hamster about Sonia and how much she misses her. And just when all hope seems lost... They went out to the old oak tree by Sonia's stall. Sonia and I used to sit here and eat apples, said Karen. And we still can, said a voice. Karen knew exactly who it was. Sonia, shouted Karen. I thought I would never see you again. I missed you so much. I missed you too. The king saw how sad I was and let us go. We're here to stay. I am sure glad. The end. I was willing to give this book a chance when I started it, but now I see my faith was very misplaced. This book doesn't know what it wants to be, and honestly, it's an inconsistent mess. The characters are all very two-dimensional, and none of the conflict has any real payoff. 
there is only one character who grows even the tiniest amount as a person. Mark. At the end, he finally realizes that he and Karen are never going to happen, which further proves that he is actually the only good character in this book. My advice to this author? Give us a Mark spin-off. Let this kid douche it up and learn the true meaning of friendship through his own series of wacky adventures. Maybe give him and his friends some kind of Nancy Drew style crime to solve. Hell, you can even make Karen a part of it. I don't care. Just don't waste good characters, you feel me? Give the people what they want! Final rating, one unicorn ex machina out of ten. So if you guys want to read this thing in its entirety and suffer along with me a little bit, you can go down to the description where I have posted a link to the full story of The White Filly, complete with terrible drawings by yours truly and terrible clip art ins inserted in the middle of each terrible paragraph. So yeah, go ahead, take a look at that, enjoy yourself or not, I don't care. Anyway, laters.